Donc, euh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Pascal Arpin. I am an artist based in Ottawa, Ontario. And these days I work primarily as a sign painter, which means I use traditional painting techniques um, to paint signs and storefronts and windows. And I do a lot of custom hand painted lettering and all of the quick, like casual and script windows that I paint are actually painted, uh, designed and painted directly on the spot, like the one you see here. And I also do um, a lot of traditional uh, gilding work, like the glass guild that you see here for Little Victories. Um, but today I'm actually not going to be talking about what I do so much. Um, but instead, I'm going to take you on like the weird personal journey of how I ended up here. So even though for the last few years, I've been working primarily as a sign painter, I am also a painter, an illustrator, a carpenter, a designer, a props master, a set decorator, uh, an art educator, and the list goes on. And today I'm going to talk about just that. So about the weird paths that I've taken over the years that have led me to try my hand at so many disciplines and eventually fall in love with sign painting. So I think self-taught creatives like I am face a special kind of insecurity. Um, I know that in my case, walking the road less traveled has also meant having to constantly fight self-doubt and ultimately just like push through those fears in order to keep growing and like keep learning new skills. And that has also meant um, having to create my own definition of success. That's, and like, that's something to keep in mind during this presentation um, or this talk is how you define success. Specifically, like how do we define it for ourselves um, regardless of what society might say. And, uh, you know, I've, I've come to realize that how you define success is actually a really personal thing. And I know that for me, the definition has changed many, many, many times over the years. And, you know, whether it's a good job, good grades, um, external validation, recognition, financial stability, you know, a million Instagram followers, um, or just loving what you do, all of these are valid, but you should allow yourself to like define the meaning of success for yourself. Um, so yeah, it's been really hard to condense this presentation to 20 minutes, but I'm gonna gloss over a lot of details and stick to my notes, so here we go. Um, so I've always loved art from a very young age, and I know that everyone says that, but it's true for me as well. And as a teen, I was like that artsy, moody, punk kid um, and I went to an art high school and like you could say that my career as an illustrator started with doing a lot of art for bands like t-shirts and records and posters um, and then from the age of 16 I started working at the National Gallery of Canada as an interpreter delivering art workshops um, and public tours and that's a job that I had for seven years so like throughout most of high school and then through all of university so when it came time to think about university, um, you know, even though a BFA uh, or like a Bachelor of Fine Arts would have been the obvious choice for me, I honestly felt a bit disillusioned with the art world. Um, and I decided to study something else completely, something that might help inform my art, um, maybe make me, help me make better art. Um, so I ended up doing a Bachelor of Humanities with a minor in sociology. So for four years, I read a lot of books and I wrote a lot of essays and it was really, really hard to make art during those years. Like I was so busy with school and work, um, but I did manage to make some here and there again for bands or like these pieces for a group show that I was invited to be a part of. And it was two other artists and myself at the Worm Gallery slash invisible cinema, which is no longer, sadly. Um, but that was a really big stepping stone for me as far as like feeling validated and like, I'm still an artist, even though my output is like so small right now. 
Um, so yeah, during those four years of school, I was really focused on my studies and I became really obsessed with grades. You know, like I was drinking the academic Kool-Aid. Um, like, and it, you could say it paid off because when I graduated, um, I was offered a full scholarship to do my master's in sociology. And I came so close to accepting it, but then that would mean becoming sociology prof most likely. And I realized that I just didn't want that. So it sort of hit me that the detour that I'd taken away from the art world was like becoming the main road. But ultimately I knew that I wanted to return to the arts. And so instead of accepting the scholarship, I declined and I felt super guilty. Um, you know, to be turning down such a great opportunity, but a master's in sociology just didn't feel like the path I wanted to embark on at that point. And my mom Brigitte that you see here, um, she approved and I'm lucky that she's always been like a big cheerleader for me to, you know, follow my dreams. Um, so yeah, at this point I needed a change of scenery. I'd been in Ottawa my whole life. I'd had the same job since I was 16 years old. I was in an unhappy relationship. And so I left my job at the gallery. I packed some suitcases and with about like two weeks notice, I left everything that I had going on in Ottawa and I moved to Nunavut. So I moved to the Canadian Arctic, um, specifically to Iqaluit, the capital of Nunavut, population of 7,000 at the time. And mostly out of sheer curiosity and also like a huge interest in indigenous sovereignty. And uh, I thought I'd live there for about a year just like to see what it was like up there. And I ended up absolutely falling in love um, with the North. And I lived there for about six years. So like from my early 20s to my late 20s. And so like part of the initial goal was to get away from academia, but it was also to find a job that would help me like tap back into my creativity again. Um, and so I started working at a center for uh, early childhood education. And I figured that would be the perfect way to get back into, you know, hands-on creative mode and it worked. So after four years of like intense, hypercritical essay writing in school, working with kids just like really got me back to like thinking creatively and like thinking spontaneously. And I eventually left that job um, to start doing freelance work. So like illustration, design, and like coordinating a lot of youth arts programming. Um, I also started hosting a weekly art program at, uh, as a volunteer at the Nunavut Women's Correctional Center. And that's a program that I ran for about five years or like until I left the North. And um, so yeah, about a year into my newfound freelancing um, work, I was approached by an organization called the Nunavut Arts and Crafts Association who saw like what I was doing around the community and they felt that they could use someone like me on the team. So even though I was really enjoying my momentum as a freelance creative, I knew that I was lacking some of those more like bureaucratic administration skills. So I became the communications manager there. And next thing you know, I was like working a nine to five for the first time in my life. I had a salary um, and it was actually a pretty amazing job. I got to travel all over Nunavut and work with like tons of amazing artists. Um, but then I eventually began to notice that the artists I was working with didn't know that I was an artist too. And then I realized like, I'm doing something wrong. Like I'm giving advice on, you know, like how to promote yourself as an artist, like making business cards, making websites, but like, I'm not taking any of that advice myself. Um, and so I was at that job for just over two years. And in that, whole span of time. The one personal pro uh, art project that I worked on was a photography series that I got to exhibit at uh, Gallery 44 in Toronto. But aside from that, like my own artistic career was fully taking a backseat. Um, and I was like totally devoted to a job that consisted of helping other artists, which was super exciting and like really fulfilling, but it just started to feel like I wasn't reaching my own full potential. So at this point, um, even though you know I had a really good job, had a good salary, um, I quit and I started freelancing again. 
And like, of course I felt like all kinds of guilt and like leaving a good job, you know, and the fear of like the unknown, like what type of work I'd be able to get after this. But as scary as it was, I felt really driven to just like take that leap and pivot back to freelance work. And I'm happy to say that it all worked out because I started getting like really fun and like really creatively challenging gigs, literally the moment I left that job. Um, and it hit me how many opportunities were out there for me, but I just needed to be available for them. And so around this time, uh, that's also when I had my first solo show back in Ottawa. So this was a big moment for me, of course, um, you know, as my first solo show. And the show went really well. Uh, it was packed, like almost every piece sold. And yet the day after I felt so, so drained and like honestly kind of bummed. And it's like, I felt like I'd given birth to a baby, but then like kicked it in the face and just like sent it out into the world. And like, it felt like I'd taken something really personal and that now is just like all out there for people to interpret or misinterpret. And that's when I realized that maybe the end goal for me, like wasn't being an exhibiting artist, you know, like that was something that had been instilled in me when I worked at the National Gallery. But I realized at this point that for me, success and happiness in my work as a creative had very little to do with like producing art for art shows. And instead, I could actually narrow it down to like three things. So working with my hands, doing creative work and being my own boss. Like I figured that even if I had two of those three things, I'd probably be doing pretty good in terms of like levels of happiness. So that was definitely a big shift in how I define success for myself. And so back up North, um, they were about to start production on a movie called Two Lovers and a Bear which had a huge Montreal crew come up and they needed an assistant scenic painter and I was available. So my interview required me to paint um, a room and age it, that, that's what you see here. Um, and so I did and then they hired me to be the assistant scenic painter. So that was the beginning of my career in film and television production. And for the next few years, um, I worked on lots of productions, got to work on sets, props, graphics, costumes, like you name it. Um, or for example, on Canoglie, which is the only Inuktitut comedy show on earth. Um, for the first season I, that I worked on that show, I ended up working on three seasons, but the first one, I was one person doing props, sets, hair, makeup, and costumes. So like no sleep, but an amazing way to jump right into it. And uh, yeah, so there's one film in particular that I worked on that really set me on the sign painting path. And like, this is where it all connects. So Zazu Myers, the production designer for the Grizzlies who had come up from Toronto and is amazing, by the way. Um, during one of our first meetings, uh, she said that the film would require a lot of hand painted signs. So I immediately volunteered. Like I was already intrigued by sign painting. I had a book on sign painters that I'd read like a hundred times. And I was already pretty obsessed with an artist named Espo or like Stephen Powers who kind of like straddles the art and the sign world. Um, and so I painted so many signs for this film. Um, and you know, as it goes with movies, the production was like super hectic, like, you know, incredibly hectic, uh, but I found myself sort of like instantly calm when I was painting signs. And there was just something really satisfying about painting a perfect letter. And so working on the Grizzlies movie really solidified how much I loved painting signs, like the act of painting signs. And, you know, that being said, I also realized how little I actually knew about signs. And like, I knew that I could copy letters or I could like paint a fake sign and make it look old or rusty or muddy, but I had no real knowledge of how they would have been painted traditionally or like why the brush strokes would be aged a certain way. And so that same year, 
even though I really loved my life up north, um, I started to feel really far from family and from old friends. And so it was a hard decision, but I felt that it was time for me to come home. So I sold the house, packed up, what was important enough to fly down with me by plane, including Cooper, my dog, um, and I moved back to Ottawa. So literally the week that I moved back, like I think it was four days after I moved back, I was asked to work on a sci-fi film. And unfortunately, I got really exploited on this non-union shoot, including the producer, Michael Dobin, not paying crew members for the last two weeks of production, which ended up going to court. But anyway, like for example, this sign that you see here, the welcome to the visitor center, I had six hours to cut, prep and paint this sign. Um, you know, like I'd be working till 3 a.m. and delivering set pieces for 6 a.m. the next day, it was madness. Um, and I'd already started to become wary of like how demanding film and TV work is in that it absolutely takes over your life. And so after that experience, I started to think, you know, maybe film isn't right for me. Um, it can be super exciting and it can be like a really great challenging workplace, especially if you have like a wide range of skills. But the reality is that you're up at 5 a.m., you go to sleep at midnight or later, you don't have time to text your family, you don't have time to text your friends. It's like a super intense pace. So even though like I could have worked in film for the next 30 years, um, you know, I swore that I would just never work a non-union film gig again. And I decided to quit working in film at this point. So since my favorite part on both the last productions I'd worked on was painting signs, I decided to put my energy into learning how to paint real signs like the traditional way. Um, so as one does now, nowadays, I grabbed my laptop and I Googled sign painting workshops. And that led me to a man named Mike Meyer, who was offering workshops out of his uh, shop in Mazeppa, Minnesota, a town of 700 people, just an hour south of uh, Minneapolis. So I signed up. And I drove down about 23 hours. And when I got to his shop, I was just blown away. Um, his shop felt like I walked into a dream and watching him paint was so hypnotizing. And he's kind of like a burly, like rough around the edges uh, kind of man, but he held the brush with like so much grace and could paint the most delicate script. And like watching him paint was absolutely life changing. His shop, you know, everything about it. Um, and like that's where I saw some of the hand lettering that really, really, really solidified my obsession. Uh, like these examples. So these words just looked so beautiful. And there's just something so magical about them um, and like very nostalgic, but also like very full of life. And I was already drawn to the old school American, like casual and script lettering. Um, but these were more beautiful and exciting than like any lettering I'd seen before um, or script like these, which were painted by Mike. And I still look at these pictures like regularly. And for me, these two examples, really sum up like my script goals. Um, they're effortless, they're bouncy, they're vibrant, and like they just bring joy to my eyes. <laughs> like even though I've looked at them a thousand times, they still do. And I, you know, I even have the one on the right tattooed on me. Um, but yeah, so I was at this workshop and so this was my first, uh, first time trying script with a lettering brush. Uh, so, you know, don't give up is the message here. Um, but a few days into the workshop, Mike and I were getting along really well. And he could see that I was uh, just super hungry to learn and to get better. And he asked me what I did back in Ottawa. So I told him I was freelance creative. And he asked if I'd want to go on tour with him. He said the next tour would be driving from Minnesota to Salt Lake City, then Portland, San Francisco, LA and Phoenix, Arizona. And he needed an assistant to drive and to set up the workshops and help out. And so of course I said, yes, I said I'd need someone to watch my dog, but yes, absolutely. That sounded amazing. So for the next two and a half years, I'd be on the road with him for a few months and then I'd come home for a bit, then be back on the road and like going back and forth. Um, 
just learning to paint letters and you know that became a whole new world and a whole new focus for me and i was like on the sign painting highway literally and figuratively you know between assisting him with the workshops and like learning every day meeting sign painters from all over painting all day like it was it was an absolutely amazing um gift you know for him to take me under his wing and so we drove all over the united states multiple times we held workshops in every major city. Um, these are some of the, uh, the pieces that I painted in the cities that we were in. You know, like, like New York, Philly, Detroit, Chicago, Portland, LA, Oakland, San Francisco, uh, Orlando, Providence, you name it. You know, we, we went everywhere and it was incredible. Um, and, you know, I was learning so much on tour um, and then coming home and applying what I'd learned to like actual businesses here in Ottawa. And it did lead to like a pretty hectic life. I was either always leaving Ottawa and trying to finish client work or like just coming back um, with, you know, a line of clients waiting for me. And so it, it also led to some hard life choices. You know, it meant the end of like the relationship that I was in. And it meant I had to find like a new family for my dog Cooper because I was gone all the time. And, you know, like, those are the sad parts that, like, you don't necessarily see on Instagram, but they're still, like, a reality of, like, living the dream or, you know, following your, <laughs> following your dream. Um, and so, yeah, through my travels with Mike, um, I became part of a, oops, I became part of a larger um, community of sign painters, like, across the States, but also internationally. And I went to my first letterhead meet. So like the first in Quebec City and then in London and Tokyo and traveling to Europe and Japan, like to nerd out about letters with all my favorite sign painters was just like pretty incredible. Um, but enter Craig Winslow that you see here. So we had met in Portland on the first tour I did with Mike and hung out at the London letterheads. And then when we traveled together in Japan to Kyoto, Craig went from an acquaintance to basically like the brother I never had. And then in September of that year, we met up in LA. No big deal. Well, I was on tour with Mike. <laughs> um, and he told me that my skill set would make me just the right person for a gig he was working on at the time. And he happened to have become Tim Burton, the film director, Tim Burton's right hand man in coordinating his Las Vegas art exhibition at the Neon Museum in Las Vegas. So I was just like, let me know if you need me. <laughs> and uh, a few weeks later, he called me and asked if I'd want to come work on the show and if I could be in Vegas that night. So I got on the next flight I could out of Ottawa and like by noon the next day, I was in Vegas in Tim Burton's hotel villa, getting instructions from him as to what he wanted me to fabricate over the next week. And, um, yeah, so there's so much I could say about this, but in a nutshell, initially my role was um, to bring Tim Burton's sketches to life. You can see like the sketch here a little bit and in the last picture, um, but turning them into pieces that would be part of the exhibition. And um, the one you see here is for the main diorama that I had to work on, which featured uh, Oyster Boy and Pearl. So I got to work alongside him every day and bring his vision to life with about a week until the opening and it was incredible it was the coolest thing i've ever done um i drove around like all over stores in vegas trying to find any materials i could use to create the scene in the dioramas and like PetSmart, michaels whatever like lowe's you know home depot and with some pretty like major sleep deprivation it all eventually came together and the really special part is that like at first I was just in charge of making and like sort of fabricating and painting these dioramas. But when Tim saw the first character I painted, which was Oyster Boy that you see in the bottom right corner, he loved it. And he asked if I'd be able to paint more of the pieces. So I obviously said yes. And like felt maybe the most validated in my skills that I've ever felt in my life. Um, so yeah, this was absolutely surreal. And it was also like infinitely inspiring to see how Tim Burton thinks and works 
and like having him trust me and be like, Pascal, I need your thoughts on this. Or like, how would you age this? Or like, you're an artist, you'll understand. Felt like really wild. And, um, it, you know, it was a really small team too. So that made me like the only actual painter on the team. And it was like the ultimate test to perform under pressure. You know, like he'd be like watching me paint. Um, and so after the opening, he asked me if I'd stay a few extra days to paint like small signs in his uh, handwriting to display um, his uh, poems next to the works. So I stayed a few more days. And when I eventually flew home, the takeaway from this whole experience for me was so clear. It was like, okay, if Tim Burton likes the way I paint, like if he thinks I'm a good painter, then I need to paint more. <laughs> and like, it's amazing how external validation works sometimes, but you know, it does. And so this is where I am now with my painting. Um, so this is my first oil painting ever, no lie. So um, basically on the side, I started to teach myself to oil paint. Um, and like my whole life, I've wanted to learn that skill but it always felt really daunting because I, I felt like if I, if I can't paint in oil, then am I even a painter? So I just never, like, I just never went there, but you could say that Tim Burton gave me the confidence to start learning. So I pushed through my fears. I got a few books on oil painting, just went for it. And this was my first. And then this is my second, um, my second oil painting ever. And so, for me, these works have been like a long game because I had a vision of this kind of painting, merging like figurative painting with lettering, like in the back of my mind, when I went down to Mazeppa to learn lettering from Mike back in 2017. And so it's like, took a few years to learn how to letter. And then I had to figure out how to use oil paint, but now I'm finally combining the two. And this third work here, I've never even shown before. I've never even shown on Instagram. I, I did share like a glimpse to close friends. Um, <laughs> but this is my latest one. And it really feels like I'm reaching a new level with these pieces. Um, you know, where it's like, this is that moment where everything I've learned is coming together. And now I've like finally gained all the skills to make it happen. Um, so yeah, the other kind of full circle moment is that since leaving the film world, um, I've still taken the odd film or TV gig, but like the really cool thing is that now I have film productions reaching out to me to paint signs for them. So instead of selling my soul to the production for a few months, now I can just like paint the signs in the comfort of my studio and charge them as a contractor. Um, and then, yeah, so another side side project that I should mention as I'm wrapping up is um, the comic book that I've been illustrating over the last three years. And it was written by Cara Tierney and it's called Phantom Tits and we just released it a few weeks ago and you can actually read it online at phantomtits.com. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, uh, what I'm trying to say by taking you through my weird life story is that I feel like my journey as a creative can be summed up as like always staying open to new paths but just knowing when it's time to change directions and I feel that like the beauty of my own journey so far has really been like carving out my own unique um learning right and like I've picked something up from every gig I've worked uh, and it's, cu it's cumulative, like realizing that it's not a zero sum game, meaning you don't necessarily lose something by branching out and trying something new. Um, so yeah, there are two sayings, I guess, that I'll, I'll end with that have like really become my life mottos and like sum up my journey really perfectly. And the first is, if you don't know where you're going, any road will lead you there. And the second is fortune favors the brave. So like never in my wildest dreams would I have thought you're gonna move to Nunavut so that you can start working in films, so that you can become a sign painter, so that you can work for Tim Burton. Like, and that's just it, like that's the point. Like sometimes the path you're on just isn't as clear or as linear or as obvious as what you think it should be or could be, and that's okay. So for me, it's taken like a lot of leaps and twists and turns, but 
I've come to realize that in like almost any job that I've found myself in recently, at least, I would really just rather be painting. And it took a while to figure it out and it could still change, but you know, that's where I am. And on that note, it's time to change directions and end this presentation. And so thank you for listening. And thank you so much to the design clubs for having me and to Safi and Romain. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me as part of this talk.